from Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Coming up today, K-State's Sarah Lancaster will talk about making the proper herbicide selection for spraying winter wheat as it's now actively growing, basing that decision on the growth stage at the time of application. She'll talk about the various products and when to best employ them. Then K-State's Jeff Whitworth will report on pea aphids now actively feeding on growing alfalfa and whether those merit an insecticide treatment. He'll also provide an update on alfalfa weevil pressure in stands around the state. And K-State's Charlie Lee reviews this week a new study out of Illinois which looked at the economic impact of birds feeding on insects in corn and soybean fields. All that and more directly ahead on Agriculture Today. Make hand washing a healthy habit everywhere you go. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after going to the bathroom, before, during, and after preparing food, and before eating. If soap and water aren't available, use a hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol. Life is better with clean hands. A message from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Thanks for tuning in. This is Agriculture Today. Well, winter wheat growers, input for you now on managing those emerging weeds in your hopefully developing stands now and making the right herbicide selection, also critical for any number of reasons. We have brought by now via video chat. Sarah Lancaster, weed management specialist with K-State Research and Extension. She authored an article on this topic, as you might suspect, in the recent Agronomy e-update newsletter. Sarah, it's all about stage of plant development when it comes to herbicide choices for wheat at this point of the growing season, correct? Absolutely, Eric. You know, a lot of our wheat is going to be big enough now that we can start thinking about some of those um, spring post applications. So we should be, you know, right in in the the thick of a lot of that. And then the next big thing we're going to start looking for is going to be the wheat getting too mature. And so we start to cause some injury um, in that way. But for most of these products that we're we're looking at here, it's going to be, I'm looking for the two leaf stage of wheat. So we're, we're should be well into that by now. Well, let's talk of what's, useful right away here and what can be held off until a little later on. When you look at the herbicide categories, which ones need to be applied in relatively short order here? Okay, so there's a group of products that need to be applied before the plant starts to joint. So some of the more popular ones for that time period would be dicamba. Dicamba has to be applied before wheat starts to joint. Some other things that fall into that category would be herbicides like Agility, Olympus, PowerFlex, Rave, for example. And those will be effective against a pretty decent swath of weeds out there? That's right. So, you know, depending on the product, you're going to get different different weed control. So, you know, dicamba being a plant growth regulating herbicide, it's going to do a good job on, a better job on Broadleaf species, things like uh, kochia, maybe some Russian thistle. Um, Not so good on some of the mustards, though. Okay, so when we start thinking about mustards, we need to start looking into some of the other products. While we're on the topic of dicamba, you note that that product does have some residual control, which may widen the opportunity to rein in certain weeds. That is very true. So, you know, we often think about dicamba as being a a post-emergent product, but it does actually have a limited amount of soil activity. And so it's a good idea to try to to use that to your your advantage, especially for things maybe like kochia. Products that could be held off for a while up until, as you note, the flag leaf stage. And there are actually quite a few herbicides that will fit that category, you say. Absolutely. So... Uh, one of the the newer products to think about in that category is something called Pixaro, Pixaro EC. It's a Corteva product that should should take care of some problematic weeds for us, things like kochia, horseweed, flixweed, things of that nature. So that could be something to consider if there's someone out there looking for, you know, maybe a new product to try. 
in their system. That's a new addition to a lengthy lineup of other options, though, right? That's exactly right. So um, all kinds of options um, can be applied through flag leave. Some things like Affinity, very common products like Ally, Harmony, um, other products like um, Husky or Talonor. So a wide variety of things. Another very commonly used product um, that kind of falls into the Slater category and in fact can be applied all the way through boot stage is that Ally 24D combination um, and other things like Glean or Finesse or even um, Starring. So, and again, we've talked about Kosha several times. Starring can be a good, a good choice if you're dealing with Kosha um, in your system. We've talked of 24D. There's another common alternative, MCPA, which could be considered as well. And in fact, you note that MCPA often can be safer on wheat than 24D. That's right. So, you know, thinking about those growth stages, as plants start to tiller, 24D becomes a more viable option. If you have, you know, wheat that has gotten off to a little later start greening up and, and doesn't have quite the growth maybe that you would like, MCPA could be a better option. MCPA can be relatively safe on that younger wheat, whereas other applications may not be so much? Yeah, um, the MCPA is going to be better for some of that smaller wheat. You can get some stunting of growth if you apply 24D too early, so you want to avoid that. In the case of either MCPA or 24D, those are each available in Two formulations, the amine or the ester formulation. Any advice on which of those to go with or are both comparable? What? So there are some differences in formulation. General rules of thumb would be that esters tend to have a little um, higher activity, but they also tend to be a little more volatile. So there's a couple of different factors to consider there. Uh, when you think about choosing those formulations. Uh, and it, in the springtime, drift can be a concern, but maybe not as much as in other parts of the year. So that would be one of those factors to ponder. Absolutely. You know, it, looking around um, your field and paying attention to neighboring crops, um, you know, some products that might be, depending on where you are in the state, you know, grapes are one one thing that is notoriously sensitive to, to 24D. And so if you happen to be in an area where there's a high value crop like that, you want to, to make sure that you're taking necessary precautions. Well, any of these applications that we'd look at in these upcoming stages of wheat development, can a great number of these products be applied in combination with fertilizer if one's not top dressed their nitrogen yet for example in a safe mode yes a lot of these products could be applied with nitrogen fertilizer actions so now would be a great time to be thinking about that you know particularly with liquid nitrogen eric ester formulations we were talking about the differences between esters and amines and we talked about applying with fertilizer esters actually tend to be better for use with fertilizers whereas amines the, the nitrogen component um, and that amine formulation can cause problems um, when you try to mix with liquid fertilizer. So if you are planning to use nitrogen for your carrier and try to apply herbicide with your, your fertilizer, think about those formulation factors for that. Now, label information will cover a lot of these considerations here, as will the chemical weed control guide for K-State. And you would as always, urge producers to reference either or both of those sources. Absolutely. If one is not careful about herbicide selection here, the consequences to the wheat crop, what would they be? Will they be in the form of reduced yields or impeded plant performance that would, in fact, influence yields? What? So herbicide injury to wheat can look like a number of things when you talk about um, applications that are not um, timely. So things like 2,4-D might cause stunting of growth and reduce tillering and damage yield potential that way. 2,4-D on the other end, if you apply it too late, can cause malformed heads. Um, herbicides can cause um, other damage that reduces yield potential, specifically, particularly um, if you go too late um, with your application and, and are applying when those, those seeds are, are boot stage or more. 
As we know, Sarah, sometimes the weather does not cooperate with us, and there may be a temptation on producers' parts to press the envelope a little bit on these plant growth limitations. Presumably, you would urge producers to not take too many chances here. That's right. That's right. You know, there there are some options. If you miss one growth stage, we typically will have something that is an option for later on within reason. So, yeah, just pay attention to growth stages and, you know, a plug for scouting. Scouting fields is so important um, in terms of knowing which herbicide to choose, um, both for weed spectrum and for, for crop growth stage. Well, we're into that growing season once again with dormancy. Uh, no longer the case in our wheat stands. It's off and running. We'll be into the row crop season soon enough as well, so we'll be visiting again. But Sarah, thank you right here for a bit of guidance on controlling weeds early on in that growing, now, winter wheat crop around Kansas. Always appreciate your time. Thanks, Eric. Sarah Lancaster with us. Sarah, Extension Weed Management Specialist at Kansas State University. And again, reference the Chemical Weed Control Guide from K-State. Ask about it through your local Extension office or go online to the K-State Agronomy website. Also, this article on weed control in winter wheat upon breaking dormancy found in the Agronomy e-update newsletter dated March the 20th. And while you're referencing that, you might go back a week to the e-update edition of March the 13th. Sarah has another article right there. It is an overview of the new herbicides for Kansas crops here in 2020. She already mentioned the Pixaro compound you can use on wheat. There is a full descriptive of five other new herbicide options for you producers to consider. These for corn and soybeans, principally. All of them combinations of existing herbicides. So give that information a look, if you would at agronomy.ksu.edu, once more part of the e-update newsletter series there. We'll stand aside for a moment and then be back with more on this Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about seven tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Agriculture Today is back now and with a briefing on insects that are active now in our field crops around Kansas. This time of the year, we periodically bring in Jeff Whitworth, crop entomologist, K-State Research and Extension. Some of the usual suspects we have visited about before, we'll update folks on those, Jeff, pests in alfalfa and in wheat. But what is up with this early arrival of ticks? Yes, the ticks are out. The ticks are hungry, apparently. Uh, the main ones that I've been getting calls about are... The wood ticks or dog ticks, same thing. And these are the ones that I think most folks are running into. A lot of folks have been out burning or working in their gardens or being outside as we're supposed to do, get outside and kind of, you know, stay away from each other. But the ticks enjoy that more. The more people that are outside, the more hosts they are. And as they come out of winter, uh, they come out of dormancy, they are really hungry. So one of the things I get a lot of calls on and I have just the last few days is if I get a tick, will I get a disease? Because, you know, everybody's all worried right. about viruses and pathogens like that now. Ticks in Kansas can transmit or vector diseases, but most of them don't. It's, they're very rare, the ones that actually do. But what we tell folks is preventing measures Keeping ticks off you is stay out of grass if you can, stay out of woodland areas. Ticks, uh, they don't crawl very far. They can't fly, so they don't go very far from where they overwinter. The main thing they do is on nice warm days, they will crawl up on nearby vegetation, grass or little bushes, and they wait for a host to pass by. And they're not real picky. They'll jump on a dog or a rabbit or a skunk or a human. So once they climb onto you, It'll take them a little while. They'll search around, 
before they actually attach. So what we try and uh, tell people to do is wear light-colored clothing, not that those repel ticks, but they're easier to see because our ticks are dark-colored. The next thing is try and get a repellent with DEET, D-E-E-T, as one of the active ingredients and or permethrin. Permethrin is a product, and make sure on the label of whatever you get it says is, you know, utilized for ticks, and spray that on around the bottom of your trousers and your shirt and places like that before you go out. That's not 100% sure, but it really helps. And then once you get through uh, with the activity outside, be sure and check yourself, your kids, uh, all over, and try and find any ticks that may be on you before they actually attach, since it is apparently going to be warmer for the next week and then not get real cold uh, for 10 or 14 days, and people are going to be out. Uh, hopefully, they'll be out exercising and staying away from each other uh, and also staying away from the ticks. Well, on to our crops, Jeff, if we might. And you have a couple of more to report in alfalfa. There are two kinds of aphids, the pea aphid and the cow pea aphid. Are these not one and the same then? Uh, yes. In alfalfa, that's what I'm getting most of the calls about. Jeff Saylor from the Extension Central County Extension sent me some pictures and told me about several fields in south central Kansas that are pretty well infested with cow pea aphids. Cow pea aphids and pea aphids are the two main aphids we worry about in alfalfa this time of year, mainly the pea aphid. The pea aphid is a cool weather insect. Cow pea aphids, more a warmer, late spring, early summer type insect, but Apparently, there's some pretty good populations building up in south central Kansas of cow pea aphids. Cow pea aphids are maybe kind of a smoky black, charcoal black color. They are known for producing vast quantities of honeydew. So when you have black aphids in your field, those are cow pea aphids. One of the things about cow pea aphids, we always find them this time of year, but not in the size of the colonies or the infestations that I saw in some of the pictures that Jeff sent me uh, from South Central Kansas. Like I said, they're normally they prefer warmer weather, but they can build up, and these some of these colonies are building up. It looks to me like pretty good uh, sizes. Now, we don't have a treatment threshold for cow pea aphids because we just don't have that much of a problem with them year after year. But remember, aphids, they reproduce parthenogenically. That means they don't have to waste time looking for a mate. They don't waste time mating and laying eggs and waiting for the eggs hatch. The females just produce females. So these populations, under the right conditions, can uh, explode pretty quickly. But the cowpea aphid, they're black. They're usually a good attractor for beneficials because they produce so much honeydew. And usually we don't recommend treating them, especially early on, because they are acting as a host for beneficials. But this is a little early, and even though there are a few beneficials around, they're not a whole lot. So some of the pictures I saw and some of the testimony I got from some other growers was some of the alfalfa is starting to wilt a little bit in places. Now, the treatment threshold for pea aphids should work for the cow pea aphid also, and that's about 50 or more aphids per stem. Now, that's per stem, not per plant. Uh, and you can have an area in a field, a few plants with a lot of aphids, but not very many on the rest of the field. So you got to take that into consideration. You also have to take the health of the alfalfa. If it doesn't look like the aphids are actually wilting the leaves yet, if there's not a lot of honeydew, that might mean they're not feeding too much. They're just building up populations for a little while. And that might give the beneficials time to come in and help control them. Or if you see any lady beetles or mummies, uh, we call them, you know, the, the aphids that have been parasitized by the little wasp. Uh, if you see any of those, I would really hesitate treating for cow pea aphids or pea aphids. But apparently uh, some fields in south central Kansas have reached um, grower thresholds, so they have treated some of those fields. Along with that, alfalfa weevil larvae are starting to hatch out. 
at least in South Central Kansas. I was looking all over North Central Kansas last week, and I didn't see any. But I will get out again this week uh, after a few more warm days and check it. But uh, treatment threshold for alfalfa weevil larvae, again, everybody has their own threshold because alfalfa is, you know, a unique crop and that some folks grow their own for their own use and some folks just sell a little bit and it's just not like corn or soybeans where most of it's harvested and hauled to the co-op. So treatment thresholds are a little bit different where alfalfa is concerned, but Generally, the treatment threshold that we recommend is if you have one alfalfa weevil larva per two stems or maybe per three stems. So if you have a 33 and a third or a 50% infestation, that's probably the time to treat. Now, some guys, when they first see these alfalfa weevil little pinprick holes in the alfalfa, they want to get out there and spray, and they think it's going to kill the alfalfa weevil and it's going to kill the aphids, and it will but it also kill all the beneficials. And those eggs for the alfalfa weevils are going to continue to hatch for another two or three weeks. So you probably have to come back in with another treatment. Use some restraint then is what you're saying? That's what we recommend. Like I said, it's a judgment call. If you have a new field of alfalfa and the growing conditions aren't great and it looks like you have pretty good infestations of weevils, plus some of the plants are wilting, uh, or maybe looking a little yellow, and you got aphids all over them sucking the juice out, you might want to treat. But again, if you do it too early, you're not going to be doing yourself a favor. So I, I really recommend holding off on not trying to treat the alfalfa weevils until you get a 30 to 50 percent infestation level because they're just now hatching. You're just starting to see those little holes show up. Um, like I said, a lot of guys get antsy and they want to get it early. But you're not going to lose anything relative to yield until your field gets up to 30 to 50% infested. Again, unless you have a lot of aphids feeding on them and they're co-stressing the field with the weevil larvae. But that's going to be rare. Under good growing conditions, a good hard rain should wash some of these aphids off also. won't bother the alfalfa weevil larvae. But, uh, so just get out there and look. Don't be too quick to spray the aphids or the alfalfa weevil larvae just to maybe save one spray or two and only have to spray once or twice. And very quickly here, Jeff, in our remaining time, the latest on cutworm activity in alfalfa and especially in wheat. Yes, the army cutworms are still around. They haven't developed a whole lot in the last couple of weeks, but they're still out there. As they get larger, they're going to cause more damage. And I have heard of a couple of fields that were treated with insecticide in alfalfa and wheat. So just make sure you get out and you look. If you got five to eight army cutworms per square foot, that's not just in one area, but that's in at least 50% of the field, it might justify a treatment. Otherwise, I think growing conditions are good enough, especially for wheat, that you probably won't have to spray for army cutworms. Alfalfa, a new alfalfa field might be different. You want to get out and check, make sure they're not holding it back. Very well. Well, we do appreciate once again you keeping us in the know on how these insect infestations are developing in our field crops in Kansas. We'll have you back again soon. Jeff, many thanks to you. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Eric. That update from crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth of K-State Research and Extension on agriculture today. And we'll return in a moment with still more here on the K-State Radio Network. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus. So we should all stay home to lower the risk for everyone. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part. Because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Welcome back to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Next up, the highlights from today's agricultural news page for you. Courtesy in part of DTN. This week's Kansas Crop Progress and Condition Report out of the USDA reads like this. Topsoil moisture supplies in the state are at 15% surplus, 69% adequate, 16% short to very short. Subsoil moisture, similar story, 12% surplus, 72% adequate, and 16% short to very short. 
the state of the winter wheat crop in Kansas, now 50% good to excellent, 38% fair, and 12% poor to very poor. Winter wheat jointing now at 3% across the state, according to this week's report from the USDA. A federal judge in Montana has thrown out a court case against 15 state beef councils filed by RCAF USA after the beef councils signed agreements with the USDA declaring that the department has authority over their activities. Ranchers Cattlemen Action Legal Fund United Stock Growers of America, or RCAF USA, had asked the U.S. District Court for the District of Montana to declare unconstitutional the beef councils in Kansas, Montana, Nebraska, South Dakota, Texas, and 10 other states. The chief district judge for the U.S. District Court in Montana, Brian Morris, on Friday accepted Magistrate Judge John Johnston's findings and recommendations to toss out the cases against state beef councils because each of the councils have now signed memorandums of understanding, giving the USDA authority over their promotional, advertising, and marketing activities. The USDA's control over the state beef councils then fell under the umbrella of a landmark 2005 U.S. Supreme Court case that ruled that the federal beef checkoff is government speech. Morris and Johnston, in the ruling on Friday, cited that the memorandums of understanding between the beef councils and the USDA included some state beef councils not part of the lawsuit, putting the beef councils as answerable to the USDA and thus under the same view of government speech as the national checkoff program. Now, nearly three years ago, the same court had granted RCAF a preliminary injunction in ruling that the federal beef checkoff program violated the First Amendment to the Constitution. The USDA appealed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, where that ruling was affirmed. But as that court case began to move its way through appeal, the USDA began signing those MOUs with the State Beef Council. As a result, the Montana federal judge's ruling said the speech of beef checkoffs is government speech and not subject to the same litigation that would occur with private speech under the First Amendment. RCAF USA CEO Bill Bullard told DTN that his group may consider another appeal. And the USDA will release its prospective plantings and grain stocks reports within the hour at 11 o'clock this morning. The Dow Jones Survey of Analysts expects the USDA survey to show 94.3 million corn acres. That would be up from 89.7 million last year. Soybean acres are projected at 84.7 million, well up from the 76.1 million of a year ago. An analyst's estimate of just shy of 45 million all wheat acres would be down slightly from last year's 45.2. The 30.8 million acres of winter wheat is expected down from 31 million acres a year ago. Again, that USDA perspective plantings and grain stocks report out at 11 o'clock. Next up for you, K-State's Mike Brook with this week's edition of Milk Lines. Mike? Today I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy producers concerning the totals that we see for the 2019 milk production across the United States, as well as here in Kansas. These numbers have been made available to us recently, and I think it's maybe a good idea to review 2019 and a little bit about maybe where we're headed in 2020. So as we look at the 2019 year as as a nation overall, we saw about a 0.4 increase in milk production over 2018. So slight increase, uh, but this was the 10th year in a row that we had a record high milk production compared to uh, previous years. So even though it was a slight increase, it still uh, will go into the record books as our record high production. And that is for the 10th consecutive year that uh, we have done that across the United States. So as we look at uh, milk production across the United States, looking at the individual states, how does Kansas stack up against uh, the competition? This year, uh, we are in 2019, uh, we were the 16th in total milk production, which was the same ranking that we had in uh, 2018. As we look at some other things like uh, per capita milk production, Kansas uh, continues to uh, grow milk production, our population does not necessarily keep up with that. So currently uh, in Kansas, we produce about 1,300 pounds of milk 
per person that lives in the state of Kansas. That does make us a surplus state, and that uh, did change as we look at 2019 numbers compared to 2014 numbers. So in the last five years, we've seen a uh, 22% increase in the per capita milk production uh, here in the state of Kansas, which uh, puts us uh, near the top in terms of other states across the nation. Uh, We currently uh, rank uh, fourth in uh, production increases in the last five years, again, comparing 2019 to 2014. So uh, we uh, continue to be a, a leading growth state in terms of milk production. One of the last things I guess I'd like to uh, talk about just uh, for a minute is where do we rank in terms of milk production per cow? As we look at that, uh, in 2019, we ranked 14th. 2018, we uh, ranked uh, 13th. So we did slip just a little bit on per cow milk production in 2019, but not a terrible lot. Uh, As we look at uh, states around us, just to note on uh, milk production per cow, uh, Colorado actually ranks number two, uh, just behind Michigan. If we drop down uh, to the south of Colorado to uh, New Mexico, they rank number three, and uh, directly south of us, across Oklahoma into Texas, Texas ranks number five. So got some states uh, here in uh, kind of the central part of the United States that are really uh, pushing on uh, production per cow. But again, uh, Kansas uh, in 2019 posted good numbers in terms of uh, total milk production as well as uh, milk production uh, per capita and milk production per cow. So hats off to our dairy industry that still continues to do a very wonderful job of managing their cows and uh, growing the dairy industry here in the state of Kansas. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension. Thanks, Mike. And we'll be back on Agriculture Today. With the shortage of primary care physicians, especially in rural areas, health education and disease prevention are vital. K-State Research and Extension programs address quality of life, personal development, and health behaviors across all life stages of all social economic groups. To learn more about health education, one of K-State Research and Extension's five grand challenges, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. This agriculture today comes to a close with another look at wildlife management featuring wildlife specialist Charlie Lee, K-State Research and Extension. You have in hand this week, Charlie, a study just recently published out of the state of Illinois. What this got into was bird predation on crop pests. And we do know that bird species do uh, work over those insect pests out there in our crop fields, right? Yes, there's been a number of studies that show birds may provide substantial pest control services in a variety of ag crops through the top-down control of pests. But there are others that have shown that there's really a neutral effect, and then other research has reported direct negative effects caused by the birds damaging or consuming crops. So it's Difficult to put an exact value on those services or disservices in terms of plant damage or pest density unless you look at crop yields. And this research report did that to try to calculate the crop yield impact of birds in corn and soybeans, which are by far the most widely grown row crops here in the United States. And there's very little information on the effects of birds in those systems. So this particular study looked at the indirect effects of bird predation on crop pests in corn and soybean fields that were adjacent to prairie. They used bird excluding cages or exclosures over the crop plants to determine whether the birds provide that pest control service or a disservice. If the prairie provides a habitat for the birds, then they, their hypothesis was that the services or disservices would decline the further away the exclosures were from the prairie. And typically, crop field edges have higher densities of some pest species than others. And this particular trial tried to capture those yield changes. 
They also used a DNA diet analysis to determine whether the birds that they captured in mist nets in the corn and soybean fields and the adjacent prairie were consuming crop pests or beneficial predatory arthropods. Specifically, what bird species were they observing then? Well, they collected 113 fecal samples from birds, and that included about uh, 15 different bird species. But there were only four species that had at least 10 fecal samples, and that would have been the dick sissel, the gray catbird, the song sparrow, and the common yellowthroat, a fairly common prairie species. They detected DNA from 61 different insect species, and six of those were determined to be field crop pest species that were listed in the Illinois Field Crop Scouting Manual, and then some species that uh, were generally an arthropod that consumed other crop insect pests. So did they find that these birds did in fact consume large volumes of insects, and was that consumption beneficial to the crops in question, corn and beans? Yes, they documented that it was a higher corn yield and a lower soybean yield when birds were allowed access to the crops. Hmm. The DNA diet analysis on the birds showed that many birds captured in the experimental fields in the nearby prairie consumed economically significant pests of corn, primarily the northern corn rootworm, which was found in 34% of the samples, and both predatory spiders and predatory beetles. Since uh, many individual birds consumed corn pests that caused significant economic damage, that would explain why the net positive services provided by birds in the cornfield equaled about $111 per acre. The net disservice in soybeans was probably due to birds consuming the natural enemy arthropods that would otherwise be providing biological control while rarely consuming the pests themselves. So they valued the birds as a disservice in the soybean crops at a negative $140 per acre. Those are hefty numbers, aren't they? Yeah, I'd keep in mind that this was a small study done in two separate crop fields, but in one location. I think, as with many studies, highlights the need to broaden uh, the locations where the research is done and see if that holds true in other locations and perhaps under other crop management regimes. What does it say in as far as attempting to deal with, say, in the case of soybeans, that bird damage, or conversely, in the case of corn, encouraging bird activity to deal with rootworms and other detrimental pests? Well, this particular research paper did not report on how to deal with reducing the bird damage caused in soybeans, but it did suggest that perhaps farmers could take low-yield areas out of production and replace them with native plantings that would encourage birds and their services, and then thus overall increase the crop yield and biodiversity. So I think that there's some important information found in that. It may be fairly difficult to get producers to take areas out of their fields, but with many of the conservation practices um, linked to wildlife, it may be an easier sell for farmers looking for cost share on some native grass plantings. I think the study does a good job, but it still was a small scale. It shows the potential that bird communities have in producing economic uh, effects even in large-scale conventional cropping systems. But again, it needs to be documented in multiple locations on multiple years. This raises interesting perspectives on the impact of birds on crop insect pests. And it's a new study just out of the state of Illinois illustrating the monetary impact in this. Charlie, we appreciate the look at this. As always, Charlie Lee. Wildlife Specialist with K-State Research and Extension. As we go, it's a good time to bring to your attention once again our podcast service, 
where you can listen to each day's broadcast on demand or have it automatically downloaded to your mobile device. To check into how to make that happen, in either case, go to agtoday.net. Once more, that is agtoday.net. In the meantime, please be tuned in right here this same time tomorrow. Until then, Eric Atkinson bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.